Hello and welcome. Today I am joined by Dr Emma Robotham, who is MSK radiologist. So Emma, thank you very much for your time today. Thanks Andy, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, great. Well, we've got some interesting things that you just mentioned beforehand about AI. So we'll, we'll start with the basic stuff first, but um, yeah, some really interesting areas. So Emma, whereabouts are you from? So um, I'm pretty well born and bred in Yorkshire, actually. So I currently work in Leeds, but I'm I'm from um, North Yorkshire, so near Skipton, um, and uh, spent all of my childhood around there and I've ended up back here. So it's quite nice. wasn't really the plan, but that's a nice place to end up back in Yorkshire. So not too far away from my old stomping ground in Leeds. Very good. Well, when you say it wasn't part of the plan, did you did you have a plan at any point? Uh, probably not. No. Um, so I just mean, actually, what happened was I, as I'm sure with many people who study medicine, um, traveled around quite a lot as a junior doctor. So um, I didn't know I wanted to do medicine at all, really. Actually, I was quite unsure, as I'm sure many uh, teenagers are. So I went to um, St. Andrews University, first of all, to study medicine because um, they gave you a degree after three or four years, either three years as a BSc or could stay on and, and do an honours degree in those days and I kind of thought well actually if I don't know what I want to do that's a great place to go so I can um, back out and still have a degree at the end of that time um, but I didn't and, and loved it and uh, so spent four years in St Andrews um, picked up a little bit of golf but not so much and then moved to Cambridge so I went to Cambridge to do my clinical to finish off my medical degree so already moved around quite a bit all over the country and finished off there and ended up as a junior in Cambridge for um, for a year or two, which was a, a shock to the system being a northerner. But um, great place to do medicine, great place to learn um, to learn so much, actually, about about life, about medicine, about, um, you know, lots of different people who were there and then travelled around doing my junior jobs in, in all sorts of lovely places. I went to Durham, went to Edinburgh um and to york and then ended up finally back in in leeds doing radiology right now you were picking some nice places to go to go and right. work in there was that intentional it was entirely intentional in in those days and anybody involved in medicine will know it's all changed now but um when i was a junior doctor you could literally pick out um jobs individually and, and join them all together and sort of make up your own um training and i wanted to be a surgeon actually so i um picked out some a &E jobs and some surgery jobs. I went to Edinburgh and did paediatric surgery for, for a year, which was phenomenal. And, and I sort of uh, intended for some time to be a paediatric surgeon, but uh, for various reasons, including um, that it's a very, very time heavy commitment for consultants being, being a paediatric surgeon, very few training jobs in the country, various things. I um, changed tack a little bit after that, even though I'd absolutely thoroughly enjoyed it and um, ended up in in Leeds doing radiology which is then another six years so um, so yeah no no deliberate plan and um, back to your question but but picked out some really lovely places really interesting jobs and picked up lots of experience and different things along the way which which I think sadly now um, junior doctors don't get that that chance as much the training's all bundled up a little bit more so you do a, a batch of jobs you don't get to, to move around and see so much and see so many places and experience so many specialties before you decide what you want to do which I think is a shame really mm. but we push them through more quickly now so you know to hit those targets of, of how many new consultants or how many new GP, GPs so we get them all through a little bit quicker um, which is you know has pros and cons I think. Mm. And then just going back to like why you did choose medicine then, how did that actually come yeah. about? What, right back at school, you mean, sort of right <laughs> back back in the day? Um, well, I think I'd always just like sciences. I was a sciencey person, definitely wasn't a, an essay writer. I liked maths and I liked physics and things that had a, a definite answer. Um, and I suppose was um, was pushed a little bit by... Um, the school, I had no background in, in medicine in terms of family or, or family friends or anything, but the school that I went to, I think, were, were quite proactive in, in pushing people to do to do medicine. And um, 
and so I kind of thought actually you know I'm interested uh, why not um, but like I say I wasn't entirely sure and I think age 17 it, it's so difficult how do you know what medicine is I mean I'd never even heard of a radiologist till I was mid-20s let alone when I was 16 or 17 so I think it's difficult to know what you're committing to I think most people know about general practice and will have been involved with general practice to a, a greater or lesser degree as a as a child and an adolescent but as for everything else I don't think probably same as many different careers you don't really have the idea of what that is or what it entails um so it was purely that I was um a science sort of sciencey person really um and went there went went to St Andrews for that reason um and actually you don't see a hospital for three or four years in St Andrews they don't have any clinical medicine so um actually probably at the end of it I still didn't really know what medicine would entail um except for you know the building blocks of physiology and anatomy and biochemistry and all of those things which are still really thoroughly enjoyed um I still probably didn't really know but by then I think you feel quite committed I think you feel that there isn't really a choice to be made you wouldn't give all that up um to to change tack and and go and do something else and, and it becomes the easy option I suppose to to continue doing medicine um, and I was fortunate enough to be supported by some great tutors when I was at St Andrews who suggested then that I might apply to Oxford or Cambridge to go and finish off the degree, um, which was great because then I had a, you know, the best of both worlds, really two different places, a very much lecture based course for years and years, and then a very hospital based place for, for the last three years and um, and very different um, and obviously geographically very different, but also different in terms of the teaching, the training, um, the, uh, the the level of tutorials. I mean, you know, Cambridge has a quite um, a heavy tutorial base and they have tu tutorials in the evenings, the weekends. You know, it was quite a, a hard um, clinical placement, but but very rewarding and has set me up really, really well, I would say, um, with all of those building blocks and the sort of basis behind medicine to go on and, and have a really successful career I hope <laughs> and so you mentioned there that you felt like you were too far down the path to, to look at anything did, did you ever have any point whether it was in St Andrews or in Cambridge where you thought I think I might have I would have preferred something else yeah definitely I think um and, and I think speaking to many of my colleagues I think that's really common um, and not only as a student but also as a junior I certainly had very many moments of wobbling is this really what you want to do and I think partly because it's such a long course so you see all your friends leave you see them go to get a job you see them earning money you see them moving on um and secondly because medicine is a little bit different um certainly by the time you're doing your clinical placement the holidays are very short the commitment is very um heavy you, you know you've got no choice but to turn up and to to um uh learn more and more every day and to put yourself on the wards and in uncomfortable situations when you're still quite young and you're still really a, a student and um, I wanted to play a lot of sport and actually you can't do that when you're away on placement in a, a different hospital so in Cambridge they would use um, hospitals such as Peterborough, Ipswich, that kind of place they're quite a long way away so you couldn't be involved in those university teams or things that you wanted to do necessarily so yeah definitely there were times when you think is this worth it? Um, there's a lot of debt involved at the end of it, um, and more so now for, for students than there was for me because I didn't pay course fees, but just because of the length of the course, you know, you end up um, a long way down the line. So well into your 20s by the time you leave medical school and um, yeah, a lot of your peers have moved on by then. So it can be it can be quite difficult. And I think I'm not alone, certainly in amongst my friends and, and colleagues who, who've had wobbles along the way. And it's definitely worth it in the end. But I think that's a fairly normal process and a normal path um, as you go along. There's a lot of exams. You spend your 20s and, and greater part of my 30s probably um, doing professional exams, which takes its toll on, on all areas of your life, you know, family life, friends, sports any interests you want to do are all affected by these exams that that keep on coming the whole time so yeah it can, can be um can be a lot at times yeah i can imagine that because when i was actually chatting with um, with a friend about this recently where it's like well university i was very lucky in that i was the last year where there was no tuition fees so you've got loads of debt that you've not got there but like for, for a doctor like certainly how 
that, that that's going to be significant if you're committing that time period. What's it like when you're trying to earn money, pay off any student loans or anything that you've had? Like you mentioned that you're quite late into your 20s when you actually start to see anything yeah. substantial. Well, unfortunately, um, it's changed. I, I was very, very lucky back in the um, back in the well, I say the 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 good old days, um, the good old days of of um, free accommodation when you were junior doctor. So our um, on calls and our um, time commitment during the week was very very heavy. So we were we were asked to stay on site if possible, but that was free. So you had free accommodation, no bills, no council tax, no um, you know nothing else to worry about paying. So that was really good actually. And I know that junior doctors don't get that now. Um, and of course, the flip side and the bad side was that we were on call a lot um, and I'm um, just old enough to have still been on call for a full weekend. So you start on a Friday and, and you were on call till the Monday with, with no break in that. And I'm not saying that was ideal, but it was certainly um, common. And that was certainly the way that we expected it to be when we were um, juniors. And so you were fully immersed in the job in the environment you didn't really leave the um the site very often um except for you know full weekends off or whatever so it was quite um all encompassing all absorbing but it meant that we could pay off things quite quickly because there was there was um not much free time and uh free accommodation no bill that that was that was superb so it gave us a real opportunity to to get on top of that quite quickly and of course whilst you're into your 20s it's still a, a reasonable um you know good salary when when you do start so it is um, a long old, uh, I was seven years with, with the Cambridge, um, Cambridge was a little bit longer in those days as well. Seven years a student, it is a long time. But, um, you know, I think it, it can quickly, um, you can quickly get rid of all of that debt uh, once, once you've started earning. But unfortunately, as I say, the juniors now um, don't benefit from that, sadly. Um, not, none of those things, in fact. Um, the long weekends or the um, or the free accommodation. So uh, yeah. they have it tough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And no, I think things definitely have, have changed quite a lot. So then, so when you've, you've you've graduated and you're a doctor, then so you talked about being introduced to radiology. But like, at what point did people start talking about that in your education? So um, people start quite early talking about things. There's a bit of a, um, a pride thing in medicine where people want to inspire, obviously, the juniors to do what they do. So every time you go to a placement, people ask you if you know what you want to do. Do you know if you want to be a GP, if you want to be a hospital doctor? Have you heard of this? Do you want to do that? So um, right from the very beginning of, of being in, in hospital wards, so sort of as a uh, a first year in Cambridge, which would have been about a fourth year medical student, people start talking to you about um, what you want to do. Um, and there was a, a very lovely radiologist in Cambridge who I met whilst I was playing in a, in a band, actually. And he was a, a drummer and um, he said, have you ever really heard of radiology? And I said, well, no, not really. You know, we, we see a few x-rays in our training, but I don't... Um, don't really know much about it. So he said, well, you know, why don't you come down next time you've got a patient on the ward? Why don't you come down, follow them into the department, see what we do? Um, and that was a huge part of my interest in radiology to begin with, was just somebody telling me about it for a start, somebody that I respected. He was a very good musician um, and could sort of tell me a bit more about it and spend a bit of time. It can be hard being a medical student, just not really knowing anything, following people around, always asking. You always take, you seem to take, take, take all the time. You're asking for people's knowledge, people's time. You're asking patients a favour to let, you know, let them examine you or let you be involved. So it was nice to sort of get something back then. And I would, you know, um, go down after my shift had finished and just see what happened in the radiology department. Um, and that sort of sparked my interest. But I still didn't really know if that's what I wanted to do because, your life, depending on which area of medicine you choose, is so, so different. And I thought that maybe I would want to be a GP, um, maybe a radiologist, had a bit of interest in obstetrics and did a, you know, an interesting obstetrics placement, watched a load of babies being born and thought, oh, yeah, this is, you know, this could could be it. Um, and and you still don't really know. And, and then I was lucky enough in my first year that I was qualified to do a pilot job, which was one of the first in the country um, where the year was split into three. And one of those thirds was, was a GP job. 
um, and then I did a, a transplant surgery job and a, a medicine job doing um, gastro. So then again, you get more and more experience the whole time, which is partly why I think it's a bit of a shame that now you have to commit a lot earlier. I definitely hadn't committed um, for several years after qualifying to, um, into what I wanted to do. But I think now people are pushed earlier and earlier so that you can shorten the training and, and get them through to be qualified fully as a consultant or a GP as, as, as quickly as possible, which is a shame really. And then, so how come you ended up in MSK then, if you'd expressed interest in that, the ops area? Well, um, I say, I mean, I had no idea from being honest. So then I, I, I um, was told by this uh, radiologist that I was mentioning um, that I would need to go off and get surgery or medicine exams, which means spending years in either surgeon or medicine and doing their full Royal College exams. Um, and I had more of a an incline towards surgery. So I thought, okay, I'll go down the surgery route and um, started collecting surgery jobs and, and you have to um, have a certain amount of experience, but also then get your exams. And so um, that's how I ended up in Edinburgh doing paediatric surgery um, and started the exams up there and, and finished and got my Royal College surgery exams while I was working up there. Um, and as I said previously, could have been very, very tempted to end up in paediatric surgery because it's a fascinating field, um, quite difficult, quite um, harrowing at times. And you've got parents as well as, as patients to worry about. But that was nearly where I, I deviated and then um, decided, as I say, I mean, I, I look back and think I can't quite remember the exact reasons really why. But it, it was very tough. It was very hard. The consultants were in a lot. Um, a lot of children were in with long term conditions. It was quite a difficult place to, to be sometimes. Um, and I thought, well, perhaps I'll go back to the original plan and go back to radiology um, and apply to Leeds, which was a great centre and had one of the first UK radiology academies. So a new way of training uh, radiologists. Um, and I thought, well, I'll go there and, and, you know, see how that works out. And again, um, and I ask the first years now when I teach them, what do you want to do? What sort of radiology do you want to do? And they will say this, that and the other. And, and I said on my first day, I want to be a paediatric radiologist. So again, no, you know, no actual idea where I was going to end up. Um, and then again, I think it's often personnel, isn't it? It's often people within a department who inspire you and you enjoy working with. And there's a fantastic um, team of, of MSK radiologists in Leeds who I then did my MSK placements under and thought, this is great. You know, this is really what I want to do. They were doing lots of research, um, lots of teaching, and they were just really inspiring group of people. So I ended up then um, specialising in MSK. And then really to work in a teaching hospital, you have to do an extra year even on top of that. And um, so I did a fellowship and I did my fellowship also in Leeds. Um, so slightly unusual to stay in the same place, but I stayed in the same place and um, did uh, the fellowship um, in Leeds as well so just to become as highly trained in MSK as possible so yeah I think to, in answer to your question I think probably it's the personnel that I've ended up working with who've who've um, you know uh, guided my path I suppose and led me to end up where I am now. Mm. And in terms of the academy then at Leeds then so what does that entail and like how how does the breakdown work as the number of number of areas of imaging and radiology? Like how, how does that education pan out? So, um, and in fact, this year we've got more trainees than ever because the government have finally recognised there's a, a shortage of radiologists in the country. But we're now up to, say, 20, 20 trainees a year will come to the academy. Um, and there's a there's an actual physical academy um, within the hospital where they spend a part of their time being trained and then they spend a part of the time uh, time on the shop floor as it were so shadowing um and then uh, actually just doing the work so being in ct being in ultrasound lists being with consultants being with uh, more senior trainees so really the 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 idea of the academy was just to train more and more people because in a traditional setup you could only train um three or four people a year so there wasn't the capacity but with the academy set up so they have um ultrasound teaching on normal anatomy they have you know ultrasound machines that are just for the academy they have lots of reporting stations just for the academy and they have a, a dedicated training program that um all the radiology consultants um contribute to so they have a lot of teaching as opposed to just learning on the job so it, it's good um it's uh 
it's becoming more of a challenge with more and more trainees every year as to how to best teach them and how to make sure they all get good training because as you can see by the simple math by by not too long when suddenly gonna have a hundred um you know fairly shortly and that will be a big challenge to us so yeah it's a good setup i think it i think it did well for me i think it's a good um a good uh, system yeah so why do you think there's that growth there just before you answer that as well so we see this all the time whereas like mentors in the private sector especially mm. there's just not enough people that are able to support with learning of msk ultrasound in this instance so where do you think the growth has come from in this area well, I think for a start, it's not just this area. The whole of radiology is 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 exponentially increasing, and I think um, reliance upon imaging has definitely increased. Certainly since I started, and and probably had started to increase long before that. And when you look at absolute numbers, which we do within our departments regularly, the absolute numbers of requests of all modality, plain film, ultrasound, MRI, CT, everything is is increasing year on year on year by up to 25% a year. So I think clinicians are um, increasingly relying on imaging. Um, and in a sense, not to say that they're being defensive, but I think sometimes it's it's unjustifiable not to involve imaging in a par patient pathway um, because it's there. And so it, it's no longer acceptable in certain circumstances not to use imaging. So. You know, you might say, I mean, some of our senior clinicians, particularly the orthopaedic surgeons, will say, oh, we don't rely on imaging very heavily. But they still definitely do want to know, for example, has a biceps tendon ruptured completely or has it, you know, only partially ruptured? And they will rely on us quite heavily to, to provide that answer and decide if that patient needs to go to theatre or not. Um, and that's just one example on, you know, on, on one end of the scale. And you've got all the way up to people needing a CT head scan when they come into A&E and again you know it's kind of unjustifiable to miss a bleed in the head when you can scan somebody and therefore a lot more people are being scanned and um, and I think it would be very easy for for myself as an imager or you know a radiologist to, to criticize those clinical decisions but I absolutely completely understand that it's there so you know and, and if there's any clinical doubt then then imaging is really really helpful and um, so I think yeah, in your area, and it's sort of looking at MSK ultrasound, that's definitely increased. But again, people want to know, don't they, if they've got a bad shoulder, they want to know if they've got a rotator cuff tear, they want to know if they should go and see a surgeon, and they want to know that right at the beginning of the pathway. They don't want to wait a year to find out they've got a tear and then go and see a surgeon. I think there's um, there's more demand from the consumer, so the patient as well, to know now um, what's going on, I think. Mm. Yeah, no, it's really interesting and like you used to hear like, oh yeah, a football player needs to go and get a scan. And I think that certain like amateur athletes or those ones, that it sounds quite cool for them to be able to say, yeah, I'm going to need to go and get a scan. And because it is more accessible, it's like a, it's a vicious circle, if you want to use that expression for in that area. Yeah, I agree. And um, I mean, it's good. It means we're, we're always going to be in a job, but there is a, you know, there's a national shortage of radiologists and radiographers. Um, and I don't think that's going to go away uh, anytime soon. Um, and I think, uh, you know, imaging is is fantastic, isn't it? There's there's a lot to, to add, but I think it's lagged a bit behind that clinical demand. So at the moment, there's certainly that mismatch um, in the NHS and, and probably also in the private sector that the imaging capacity still isn't quite there to match the to match the demand and certainly now and I was just listening to the radio at lunchtime and um, before I spoke to you there's huge NHS waiting lists um, and a lot of this stuff got postponed over the uh, pandemic particularly MSK ultrasound for an example because it wouldn't necessarily be classed as um, you know life-threatening or life-changing but but now there's a huge backlog um, of a year or, or more uh, that people are uh, sort of waiting for things to be done. So I think it's going to take a long time for that to catch up on an already overwhelmed system. Mm. Yeah, and then in terms of that then, so if more radiologists are needed in this area, so that th they're obviously being taken away from other areas of medicine. So how does that dynamic work where so that the radiologist is, is increasing, that's going to have an impact elsewhere? How does that all come together? How that's a very good point. I've never really thought about that, to be honest, Andy. <laughs> I'm very uh, radiology centric. Um, but you're right. That, and there's a there's a huge shortage of GPs as well. 
Um, it's never really sold like that when you're deciding what you want to do. And perhaps that's a good thing. But when you're deciding which area you're going to go into, it's not really sold as um, competing with the other specialties. There used to be when I was um, deciding, there used to be a sort of, oh, you'll easily get a job in in X specialty wherever you want because it's a a shortage specialty and, and things that were really, really popular. You might just have to take a job anywhere you could get a job. Um, but I think things have moved on a lot since then. And actually, I think there's a it's fair to say there's a, a shortage in in almost everything. So I don't think any any junior doctors now would worry about not getting a job. They might worry about the very one particular job they want to get. But I don't think they would worry about not being able to get a job. I think there's a shortage everywhere. And that's where the skill mix um, has come in. So lots of jobs that would previously have been done by doctors are being done by other allied healthcare professionals um, in hospital and out of hospital. Um, and as you see probably quite a lot, you know, MSK ultrasound is being done by a lot of different people. Um, I was talking to an A&E consultant this morning and he was saying that minor injuries in his department are almost exclusively being seen by nurse practitioners. So, you know, traditionally that would have been a, a doctor's job and that would have been something that the A&E doctors would have done but there's just not the number. So there are these other roles, which is great, you know, and great for um, progression of career and lots of other specialties to, to sort of merge and, and, do, and do things more in tandem than see it as a, a doctor's job or, or not a doctor's job. But yeah, I think there will inevitably be competition, won't there, um, for different specialties eventually. Um, and I think GP is one of the ones that's struggling at the moment, certainly yeah. attract. Mm. And then in terms of the academy, then it sounds like an amazing setup and make, makes complete sense. So are other um, health professionals able to come into that or is that doctor only at the moment? No, it's just for the um, for the trainees on those training numbers who um, who happen to be, you know, they apply to the, the national scheme. And then um, I say now it's 20 a year, but it used to be fewer than that will we'll get appointed and uh, move through the academy uh, five years of, of radiology training so um no we do sonog we do have sonographers teaching um ultrasound in there they're teaching the um the the radiology trainees but it's not accessible to other people to come into it no it's very much about radiologists um being trained at the moment mm -hmm. yeah yeah and then in terms of other, other centres around the UK, you mentioned Leeds was quite ahead in terms of that area. Are there other ones that are coming up in the UK or other, other existing centres? Yeah, there's two other academies. There's one in Plymouth and there's one in um, Norwich. Um, and uh, I have very little knowledge of, of those, um, but they're, they're the only other two and everywhere else just does their own area of of training. I've only worked as a radiologist. I've then finished in Leeds and my first consultant job was in Bath in Somerset um, and uh, which was a fantastic job and um, but very very different again because it doesn't have its own trainees they came from Bristol but um, it didn't have a big training scheme so there was there were far fewer trainees around so it changed the dynamic quite a lot so basically just consultants working in that department um, amazing department and, and I went there um, a because it was a great department but b because they work quite closely with the English Institute of Sport and that's probably where my sports interest really started. And I went there in 2012, which was obviously the year that games were on. Um, and there were a lot of Team GB athletes based in Bath. So we had quite a lot to do with them. And then the Paralympic team were based in Bath um, during their games. So great experience thrown in at the deep end of uh, sports imaging, really, in uh, one of the most important, uh, obviously, sporting years that uh, that the UK has seen um, in recent times. So that was quite an experience. But in terms of their their mix, be yeah, very different. They don't really have um they have one or two trainees come through, but but not very many. And then obviously I came back to Leeds, um, back to being involved. There's probably a, a trainee on on almost every list that you do. So trying to multitask quite a lot teaching and training as well as actually just getting the job done and and seeing the patients and doing the reporting as well. So it's quite a quite um, a contrast depending on where, where you work and how many trainees there might be around um, as to you know how much time you give up to training and teaching and how much time you can just sort of do your own thing and and uh, and do the job. 
Yeah, no, I can definitely imagine that that would uh, dictate what's going on. So in terms of Bath then, so what was that experience like then? So was that something that you knew you were going to have access to and working with some of the Olympic athletes? Um, not really. When, when I um, was looking for my first consultant job, um, I was looking for somewhere that had a sports uh, involvement, definitely. So that's definitely why I went there. But it can be very difficult, as I'm sure you're aware also. It, it's quite a difficult world to break into. Um, so I wasn't quite sure how much I would genuinely be involved, particularly when I very first went there as a, as a young consultant. Um, but as it happened, I met some some lovely people working at the EIS who were keen to, to have radiology involvement and who um, we set up, you know, a good collaboration. And um, the team in Bath were already seeing a lot of these athletes who were, were based in Bath. Several of the sports are based there at the EIS there. So they were already doing that. And I think it was just fortuitous that it happened to be 2012 was the, the year that I ended up being appointed as a consultant there so it was a bit of a, a step up but we were also working with Bath Rugby um, and uh, they had quite a few athletes on on the what's called the talented um, athlete scheme as well so um, they already had that sort of sports um, link going on which became we talked about sort of specialising down to radiology and then MSK radiology and and then that became the thing that I wanted to specialise down to even further so you sort of find yourself from starting off with the whole field of medicine coming down to one particular area and I'd say that's really now the area that I enjoy the most um, and feel that I have you know something to give and and now um, uh, quite a lot of experience in but started yeah in in Bath in in 2012 with those different um, with those different sports really. Mm, hard to believe it's 10 years ago isn't it now that is scary. Uh, yeah yeah <laughs> yeah uh, and in terms of like, so that was a really memorable one. Have there been any jobs or roles that you've had that you just like, get me out of here? This is not what I thought I was going to be getting into. Not really. I think the very hardest one for me was being a, um, a first year radiologist because I'd been just before that um, in surgery jobs where I was a surgical registrar. Um, running the show really out of hours so you know taking people to theatre taking people appendix out doing what needed to be done as a, as a relatively senior doctor and then you go back to radiology and it, and it's such a different world um, and with all due respect to our first year trainees you know you're not very helpful and, and you, you go back to being right at the bottom of the pile not having a lot to add to the scenario and that was hard, really, really hard. And, you know, just a few months, a few weeks earlier, really, I'd been in um, a hospital as the registrar on call for surgery when, you know, people had, I just remember a man coming in with a ruptured aneurysm and, and I was it, I, you know, that that was it. And obviously called the consultant in, but start the operation and, and start going. And then a couple of weeks later, you're a, you're a first year radiology registrar being asked to sort of sit there and watch what goes on you know don't say too much don't touch any buttons don't you know don't, don't do anything um and I definitely had a good old look at general practice in those early days and thought I'm not sure I can do this you know I don't really want to be the bottom of that pile again and start learning from from the beginning but of course you know it moves quite quickly doesn't it and then suddenly you, you moved on you become more senior and 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 now I look back and yeah like you say uh, 10 10 years is is gone extremely quickly and I'm sure the trainees look at me now and and think that I'm uh, quite old um and uh, you know out of touch with that with their training and um, but I always say to them I can remember what it was like to be junior I can remember what it was like not to be useful not to be helpful but it, it doesn't last very long and um, so yeah that was probably my worst um worst bit of my career I would say so is that because you're thrown in, you're in the thick of it, really, pretty much straight away? If there's not enough, there's not enough people really to help with things or to be able to do things. No, I'd say almost the other way around. Particularly in Leeds, you're very well protected. Actually, in Leeds, you're not asked to do things you're not comfortable with. You're not asked. You're not really thrown in. I would just say that there's. Um, you can't be left as a first year to to do an ultrasound. You can't be left to do um, an acute CT list. You can't really be left to put a drain in somebody which is quite a lot of what we do as well you, you can't do any of those things because you, you you've not regardless of what you've done in clinical medicine you're not trained in radiology and it's so different such a, a different specialty um that you you physically can't be left to do those things or you know you don't have the skills or the knowledge so you, you're completely supernumerary for for at least a year um you're just sort of tagging onto people's lists or sitting with people while they report or you might report something but then you've got to show somebody and they have to sign it off anyway so you just it's just a just a big old learning um, 
curve that you've got to start. And as I say, um, in, in those early days, it it felt like it wouldn't matter if you were there or not because you weren't really contributing to the job. It was just about learning. It was all about learning, really. So back to being a medical student where, you know, please could I come and sit with you or please can I join in your list? It's very much like that until you become more um, more useful and you get more knowledge, you get more skills, you can do things a bit more independently. You're, you're not very helpful. Um you're obviously conscientious which is good you know you sort of want to be you want to be contributing to things well yeah i think but but i think that's by human nature isn't it you want to feel like you know what you're doing and you want to feel like um you are contributing and of course you're earning a salary you're not a student anymore you are earning a salary you want to be doing those things and um yeah but but it, it quickly changes uh, and it certainly feels like a long time ago now that that was me um and uh yeah that was that was definitely one of the uh um low points i suppose <laughs> if that's what you asked that question yeah um, and then in terms of that, like work philosophy have you got anything in particular like, cause, like the nhs and always talk about there's not enough money there's you know there's not enough resource there are there any limitations put on you in terms of image imaging like how does that work from that perspective because you could look at it and say well you either get an image or you don't or like the number of images you can take well i think there's two things um first of all i think there's there's rationing uh, to a greater or lesser extent. So yes, we are asked to look at almost all the requests that come in and see if there's any that don't need to be done. So, um, and from our point of view, sometimes that's easy. Sometimes it's very, very hard because we're asked to follow pathways and protocols. And particularly for GPs, I would say, they just want to do what's best for that patient in front of them. But we are then like the gatekeepers to um, stop the service from being overwhelmed. So we have to say, no, sorry, you can't have this MRI knee, for example. Right now they need to go and see um, a physio or they need to go and see an orthopaedic surgeon and see if an MRI is appropriate. So I would call that rationing for want of a better term. And that's frustrating because sometimes you can, you can read between the lines in a request that, you know, the patient's anxious or the patient's concerned, they've got some particular problem or they might be a carer or they, you know, they need... They need that imaging to move along the, the pathway, but we just can't scan everybody. And then the second thing I would say is that there's just time pressure is the other thing. So we're permanently being asked to make the appointment time shorter. You know, how quickly can you scan somebody, do an injection, get them out of the room, get the next patient in? Um, so I'd say those are the two sort of areas where it becomes obviously working in the NHS you know there is a limited a, a limited resource a limited amount of money and a limited amount of people so you have to and I think particularly um when I was more junior or or when people first come into it you're tempted to say yes to everything and try and go yeah I could do that in I could do that in 10 minutes I could do that in 15 minutes but really is that sustainable I'm not sure you can keep doing that and I know GPs have faced the same thing with making their appointment times really really short but you've got to think what's sustainable. And also we're training the next generation of junior doctors. So they have to have time to scan. They have to have time to be taught by us whilst we're doing our job. So you can't keep cutting the corners on all the appointments and cutting the corners on how many um, patients you can squeeze onto a list or how short can you make an MRI scan? Can you do without certain sequences so that you know they can scan more people in a day? But at the end of the day, then if you miss something, that's not helped anybody, has it? You know, if you miss somebody's meniscal tear, it doesn't matter how many patients you've scanned in that day. It's not done the best, best for that patient. So it's a constant battle of um, rationing and sort of resource with actually what, what's best for us. And, and I'm definitely not involved in hospital management. It doesn't interest me really at all. But equally, I think it's really, really hard. And I think the people who do it have an incredibly difficult job of balancing those things, um, you know, and trying to get a happy medium. And I'd say more and more, you feel the pressures of, of sort of rationing, um, if that's the right term, um, and, you know, being put under pressure to, to just get the numbers through and see as many people as is humanly possible within the I can see it'd be so so difficult I mean my one experience of I broke my toe as it turned out very painful obviously went in had an x-ray in the was a community hospital that's that she basically said yeah you've broken your toe referred to A&E went straight there got seen within literally about 30 minutes it was absolutely brilliant service like how good it was and it was just like this is amazing that you're getting this sort of level of service and just straight away I was like right yeah this is what you can do next so I was really really impressed with it I don't know if I just got lucky on that but I, this was 
this is probably about three or four years ago now, but I was really impressed. Yeah, and I think um, I think you can be lucky. A, you can be lucky, or B, um, it's about you've probably got realistic expectations. And I think some, I think one problem also is that, you know people do have unrealistic expectations as well as to what to um, what to expect from the NHS and and when to um, when to be satisfied that what's been done has been done in a timely manner or not. And you know everyone's different, and I think people have very different expectations. But I think. Um, people now don't want to wait anymore um, and they certainly don't want to wait very long. So it sounds like your experience was really good, but equally, you know, we still see patients who've waited not very long at all um, and will complain because they weren't seen within, you know, two or three minutes of their appointment time or whatever. So I think it's about it's about the public's expectation as well. Um, and we'll we'll definitely feel the uh, the force of that now that this kind of recovery plan is on the road post COVID. Um, I think patients still won't like that they'll still be obviously you know they talk about a recovery plan but um you can only do what we've got with the staff and the resources available so I, I think there's going to be a bit of a rocky time to come um in the NHS um and you know looking at the sorts of thing that you do Andy that that kind of is the is the advantage isn't it of then other people being able to offer um ultrasound or being able to to sort of offer injection or, or other things the nhs is 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 needing a bit of help at the moment i would say and and some patients are, are looking elsewhere to to move their own treatment on a bit more quickly yeah well, that's it i know that you and i have had discussions on this separately it's like yeah it's great there is there's big demand which is good for our business but it's making sure the infrastructure is in place in terms of them knowing like to be able to um scan correctly and understanding all of that so yeah it's, it's exciting it's just it does seem to be exploding at the moment which is great but yeah trying to trying to do things correctly is uh, is always the, the the challenge of trying to do it but yeah working with people like you really helps with that anyway so um that's great and in terms of like, the, the evolution of imaging then so how have you seen it from like for the new people coming through is as much changed in the time that you were learning radiology and, and being trained in that area to, to how it is now yeah, I mean, I think um, uh, it's only been like 15, well, was it 15 years? Yeah, 15, 16 years, which I suppose is actually quite a long time. So, um, yeah, all the time, um, everything's changing. The technology is changing. The efficiency is changing. The capability. So there's new things literally all the time and can be quite difficult to keep on top of sometimes. Different techniques, different, um, uh, different things that can be done. Um, so yeah, I think all the machines move on all the time, and um, you know I'm certainly no uh, uh, technologist, but I think that the machines literally move on all the time, and you can see that the imaging is improving on the one hand all the time. If I look at um, images I have from ten years ago that I might have done for lecture, looked at for a lecture, they're nowhere near as good as the images are now. But then different techniques, and um, I think it's a lot more available to us now. I'm a big fan of um, a technique called dual energy CT, which I won't won't go into too much detail because it'll um, uh, be slightly dull. But you know, it's a completely new thing. And when I trained it, it wasn't even really around. And and now um, I use it quite a lot. It's a completely different technique. So um, things are changing. And um, we mentioned just earlier on about um, artificial intelligence. And I think radiology is going to be involved in artificial intelligence by definition because we're so IT based, but I think it's coming into all areas of medicine, you know, regardless of, of what specialty. Um, and I think people will, people are slightly suspicious of it because obviously everyone wants to keep their job and wants to keep their, you know, what they're doing as, as what they're doing. But I think that will change the horizon quite a lot actually over the next few years. But I think hopefully in a really good way and certainly I'm trying to embrace it because I think it's coming anyway whether we whether we like it or whether we don't we've talked about how the NHS is under-resourced um certainly in radiology and I know that stands for almost all specialties the, the NHS is under-resourced so if we can employ AI to improve efficiency and take out if possible some human error so there's definitely human error in radiology, but there are in, in most specialties as well. If we can use AI to help eliminate that, then that will be much better for the patients as well. So I think that's the, the biggest thing that will happen over the next 10 years, as well as, you know, 
continuing improvement in equipment and and um, machines and things and i think we'll see that explode i don't think it will replace and well i hope not i don't think it will replace people and i don't think it will replace um humans in in any in any modality for a long long time but i think it will really help and um human error is becoming more and more unacceptable um so we're finding now you know I'm not saying that we used to get away with mistakes, but I'm saying it is just becoming unacceptable. So the level of of um, uh, getting things right has to be so high all the time that if we can use something to help us, then I think that will be great for everyone. So I think AI is is definitely coming in. Yeah, I mean, it's that when you mentioned about the sort of the, the scrutiny and so on. And I'm sure everyone is, is really conscientious and wants to get the, the right assessment. But that puts a lot of pressure on, doesn't it, all the time, which doesn't always help. Yeah, and um, I think there's been loads of studies done. There's loads of literature out there to suggest that you know people people make mistakes quite often. Even even the best the the best people in their field make mistakes. Um, and most places now try and have a sort of open and honest culture about making mistakes. But there's a lot of pressure, um, and particularly with radiology, it's there in black and white for somebody else to go back and look at. You know, ten, fifteen years down the line, there's no getting away from it. Um, so it's easy to criticise, it's easy to go back with hindsight in radiology and be critical about what somebody has or hasn't done or has or hasn't said. Um, so I think it, it, if AI can help, um, and also it's not all about radiologists, the conversations I'm having in research are about actually A&E and orthopaedic doctors reading films and giving them some confidence as well before the radiologist steps in and, and gives a report. So I think there's lots of the people are... Um, involved in radiology this will help but they're all under pressure yeah they're all under pressure to get it right all of the time um as you know i'm sure that's no different to, to any to any job or any career um but certainly you feel that pressure sometimes you know you might do 150 correct reports but the one incorrect one you've done that day will be the one that defines your week your month your, you know whatever it is because that's the one that will come back to you and and uh, never mind all the good things you've done all the good um spots that you've made it'll be that one so yeah eliminating that as much as possible is ideal for everyone isn't it really yeah and like you say it's, it's slightly different in the fact that you have literally got an image that can be scrutinized and can be looked at it's like the var of the uh you know from, from the football and that every, everyone was a nightmare <laughs> yeah everyone's got an opinion yeah, yeah absolutely and it's there isn't it for everyone to see whereas if, if you didn't have that um people probably well i suppose there's always been replays in football but you know not everyone can feel as justified in giving their opinion if it was an on-the-spot decision yeah so it's a good analogy yeah it is like that so i think it is very difficult for that person making the decision in in the heat of the moment definitely particularly if it's two o'clock in the morning and you're on call and you're a junior and the phone's ringing and people are standing over you and wanting to know you know it can be really really difficult really pressurized yeah, I'm sure. And then final question, like, I'm sure you've had many of these, but like, who, who would be sort of the most influential people that you've been involved, involved with in, the, in your career? Um, I think without mentioning any particular names, probably, um, I think there's been people dotted throughout my career, I suppose. Um, the radiologist that, you know, that I met in Cambridge who I played in a band with certainly started off my interest in, in radiology. Um, and then my colleagues that I work with in Leeds obviously inspired me to do what I'm doing now and and to get involved in in this setup and with the sports imaging um, side of things. So I think it's been a it's it's a it's a collective um, and I think it's all pieced together to, to sort of add to that experience. And I think just going back to what I said at the beginning, I think that's unfortunate that you can't really do that anymore. But I think as I've gone through, I wouldn't have changed any of those jobs and um, did some great A&E jobs that were hard at the time. They were very challenging, but have shown me different sides of medicine, different specialties. And, you know, I think that all adds to the experience of hopefully being a good consultant at the end of the day, seeing all of those things as you go along. So, um, yeah, a bit of a cop out, but I'd probably say, um, you know, lots of lots of people as I've gone through um have sort of left an imprint on my career um, and and hopefully I feel I'm, I will be able to do the same for, for the juniors that I see coming through and just give them a bit of inspiration to to, to keep going and to, to find something that they really really feel passionate about and um, that they can then pursue for the, for the rest of their careers and keep passing it keep passing it down the line. 
Mm. Yeah, definitely. No, that Leeds Academy sounds amazing. So, uh, but no, thank you very much for your time today and also in the, the previous chats that we've had. So I'm really excited about uh, the development in this area and, and yeah, having someone like your expertise involved is, is really uh, appreciated. So thank you for your time today. Emma. Thanks very much, Andy. Nice to see you again. Likewise, thank you.